Hello, and welcome to the Creator Resource Virtual Panels, where as often as possible, we'll be hosting discussions that cover topics that are helpful uh, to all of you as you navigate the comic book industry. So today we have a really exciting panel going on. Uh, we are going to be chatting about what it is to be an assistant editor, uh, the different progression paths between book market versus comic book publishers and versus wholly independent publishing. Uh, and we're going to clarify how assistant editors fit in within the process of making great comics. So I'm actually going to pass the moderating duties over to Michael Macchio, who is going to guide you through this panel. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Michael. I am a freelance editor who has worked in comics for about five years now. Um, I currently freelance for for Second, Tapas, and Mad Cave Studios, and I have been waiting to do this panel for like two or three years, ever since I was an assistant editor, because assistant editors are awesome. They do so much valuable work throughout the process, and I'm so excited to shine a spotlight on some of the most awesome assistant editors that I know working today. So if you could all please introduce yourselves. Um, again, Michael, he, him, his, um, but I will hand it over to Andrea. Oh, thank you. Uh, hi there, Andrea Purcell, she, her. Uh, I am currently the assistant editor for Iron Circus. Uh, I've been in comics for like 15 years now. So. Oh, and if you could just mention some maybe key titles that you have worked on or are working on, um, or just a project that you're proud of, just a little something to kick us off. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I'm actually incredibly proud. Uh, we just wrapped up the uh, Smut Peddler Sorted Past Kickstarter, uh, which is the second Smut Peddler anthology that I've worked on. Um, we also just did a really great doubleheader uh, Kickstarter with Abby Howard uh, for her books, The Last Halloween and Crosswords at Hell. And ah, there it is. I just got the printer's proof. This comes out in January. Uh, Julian and Purgatory. It's by... The same creator who did Lonesome Era for us, John Allen. He's a super cool dude. Awesome. Riley? Hi, uh, my name's Riley Farmer. Uh, she, hers. Uh, I am an assistant editor at IDW. I've been working there for almost exactly a year now. Um, and I work on titles, a lot of licensed comics, such as Sonic the Hedgehog, um, the several Transformers titles we have, Star Wars Adventures, and Marvel Action Spider-Man. Awesome. And Kiara. Hi, I'm Kiara Valdez. I'm assistant editor at First Second. I've been working there for almost five years now, getting up there. Um, I've worked on Check, Please, uh, Loom, Lord Dinkin Shrinking Up With Me, and a bunch of other titles. Oh, and awesome. She, Hers. Sorry. Awesome. Um, yeah, so as you can see, we have a really great um, smattering of experiences from all across the industry, from traditional book market publishers like for Second to comic book publishers like IDW and wholly independent ones like Iron Circus. Um, so before we dive into those different aspects, I'd love to hear from each of you on, you know, how you became interested in comics, how you heard about like the editorial process that facilitates everything and how you came into your roles. Do you want to go in the same order as you intro yourself? That would be an easy way to just kind of streamline it. Sure. Um, so I, um, I got into comics in a very uh, roundabout way. Um, I had the privilege of being able to um, work uh, part-time at a comic book store um, for long enough that I was able um, to become a manager and I uh, from there made the jump into marketing for comic distribution and then um, in my spare time because why not I worked as an assistant uh, helping creators at conventions and putting on events uh, which led to me um, meeting Spike and uh, working for Iron Circus. Awesome. Um, I got into comics, I started kind of like reading them and enjoying them in high school and took a few classes in college uh, where I kind of learned about the comics industry more and became more interested in the creation of them. Um, and I, I, I remember like figuring out that there was a job where you could edit comics and being so excited that like I finally found something that I could do. Um, 
And so I ended up going to a publishing program in Denver called Denver Publishing Institute um, and was able to make some connections there with previous people who had attended that, um, including somebody from Dark Horse who contacted or put me in contact with somebody from IDW. um, And that's kind of how I ended up getting my job here um, last year. Awesome. Um, So I mostly came from manga. Um, I I read some comics and graphic novels when I was younger, mostly graphic novels. Um, But I was mostly aiming since I was like 16. I don't know how I found out editing was a job, honestly. Google, who knows? But I knew I wanted to be an editor since I was 16. And I was mostly aiming to be a manga editor. But then a year before I graduated college, I met Calista Brill, my now manager um, and boss. And she just handed me in real life by Cory Doctorow and Jen Wang and was like, here. And I'm like, oh, this is a whole nother path. That's not manga that I can take. And I am actually really happy I ended up on this um, path. I joined for a second right out like, right of college. Honestly, two weeks before I graduated college is when I joined for a second. Um, and I've been there since. Awesome. Can we actually, so Kiara, can we dive a bit more into what the book market in the comics landscape looks like, especially being an assistant editor at a big five publisher uh, at First Second, which is one of the most storied graphic novel imprints that there is, um, and produced a single of the best book out there. Um, <laughs> but if you could talk a little bit about like, you know, how for second exists in the marketplace and like what your role as an assistant editor looks like at book market. Cause like, I know that you do things that like Andrea and Riley don't do things that I didn't do. And like, boom. Um, and something that I think would probably be helpful for you to note too, is like the difference between an editorial assistant and an assistant editor and what your career path looks like if you stayed in like the book market. Okay, so working for a graphic novel imprint and a traditional, like a big five publisher um, for a while, I mean, it's, it's, it's very different in the sense of hierarchy. I mean, the traditional book publishing industry is like ancient, you know, so, and doesn't change much. So there is an um, editorial system before you become an assistant editor, and there's a lot more positions until you become an editor. Um, and they're kind of, they're not completely mapped out for you, but they kind of are. You kind of know, I kind of know, I can gauge how many years until I become an editor. Um, and an uh, editorial assistant, and it's so annoying because they're literally the same words flipped <laughs> and they don't do anything much different. I mean, they do, but an editorial assistant mostly assists editorial. So they do, a, it's mostly admin, really. It's like 90% admin. You read through the slush pile and give your opinions and like maybe help out on one or two books um for first second when i first started in 2016 uh they were we were even smaller than we are now and i mean we're pretty small but we're even smaller um so i was doing a lot um outside of my range um so i was editing books at that early stage but that doesn't always happen um and then when you become an assistant editor basically is when you can start building your own list that's the biggest difference i still do a lot of admin and do a lot of the things i did as editorial assistant but mostly now building my own list and further assisting um calista i work really close with calista i edit a lot of her books and co-edit a lot of her books um so that's the main difference uh the path is a lot more stringent like like you just there's not a lot of flexibility there there are some here and there but i know exactly what's laid out in front of me um aside from that so it's really interesting because first second has been around since 2006 um that is scholastic there was like a few other publishers in for graphic novels specifically and then the 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 market crash of comics happened um a lot of them bounced out so for a second scholastic and a few others have been around for a long time and we specifically in mcmillan were basically the only people doing graphic novels for, for a while like we were the graphic novel imprint and now because of the graphic novel boom whatever we're having right now um a lot of it's coming a lot of other imprints are also doing graphic novels um but we still remain like we only do graphic novels with the occasional picture book and 
our relationship, uh, we've become more and more incorporated with McMillan as a company before we were a little, uh, just a little bit more independent, but now we're like fully supported. Our mark, we share a marketing team with the other imprints that are not graphic novel and, um, we share our sales reps and everything like that. Um, so we're just playing it's, we call ourselves a boutique, uh, uh, boutique comics imprint within a, like a big publisher and it kind of helps because we have the best of both worlds we can really curate what we like but we have the support of a big machine behind us um that all sounds awesome a quick follow-up because i'm sure that many viewers will be like oh what did kiara mean when you said building your list what does that mean as an assistant editor at a book market publisher and what does the process look when you are acquiring titles so building my list is uh being acquiring titles for myself like before i was an assistant editor for two years i was editor assistant and i was editing books but mostly they were acquired by calista they were brought in calista found someone or someone came to calista she liked them and then but she doesn't have time to edit specific ones and she would pass it on to me i still do a lot of that um even though i have my own list i do co-edit or edit a lot of calissa's books as well uh, that i didn't acquire it's really funny because check please often like i do a lot of panels i call myself the sole editor on that because i did all the editing on that but i didn't acquire that book um it was calissa who acquired it uh so and a lot of the process so i've been building my list which is means adding books that i acquired by myself for like two years now um we have a system between me and calissa just to keep myself sane because i do so much things outside of editing that i only acquire a few a certain amount of books per year which makes me quite picky um for what i take on but uh, a lot of the things I find, I either get agents submitted to me, but I do a lot of like grounds. Like I love going to cons. I go to artist alleys. I do a lot of reaching out to people I like. Um, I'm a huge web. I'm a huge web comic angle in for a second. A lot of us have our, like our niche, but I grew up on a lot of web comics. So I look at, I've acquired a few web comics that I really love. Um, and yeah so you bring i bring them in and i take them through the acquiring process which i feel like we will touch on later or well i was hoping that you would mention uh running pnls because i wanted to bounce it over to andrea and riley and be like looking at what kiara has kind of laid out how does that overlap but also differ from you know your experiences at Iron Circus and IDW because I did not have to run a PNL <laughs> until I got to Scholastic and I never personally led anything through the acquisitions process until I left um, Boom okay. as a senator. So that's what that's what I was leading towards. Can so I um, running PNLs, man. Um, so PNLs are I can't remember price and something. Profit loss and, statement. There it is. Uh, <laughs> there's so many. By the way, I think even more than comics, or maybe you have your own assortment. There are so many acronyms in publishing, in traditional publishing. Like, it's just like you can. I had to make a list when I first joined because I'm like I can't keep track of anything. Um, there is profit and loss, um, and it depends on the company. Like the form is, I think, has the same ingredients but every company has a different pnl form and these pnl forms are like older than me they're so old they're based on like algorithms and math and things like financial things that have been started hundreds of years ago and they get updated i think three times a year for us but it's the same form you plug in um so you use this form uh, you do a lot of people don't understand that when I'm acquiring a book, if I'm like, oh, look, shiny, shiny thing that I want, um, and I want to get my company to buy it, I have to do so much paperwork, and then I have to take it to this meeting with scary people. They're not all scary, but I mean, kind of intimidating people and be like, hey, look, this is why this is amazing. Please let me buy it. And then they tell me, like, okay, your PL looks good. Your paper looks good. Go ahead and buy it. So your PL has to look like that it's profitable. That's the point of the PNL. And it's a lot of plugging in, figuring out based on comp titles or titles, like comparative titles that are similar to that book in the past, how much units the book is gonna sell and how much you're gonna pay the author and jumbled all, all 
that all up in a form and you get this percentage of how <laughs> profitable it is for the company. And we, it, the, my company, McMillan's not super strict, but we, we do have a bar where like, okay, like this looks dicey, doesn't look dicey. And sometimes they let you acquire it regardless, even if it looks like you're really like going in for the faith jump, but sometimes they don't. So I run a lot of PLs. I run PLs for myself. I run them for Callista. Um, so for now, now that I'm kind of, they're kind of easy to me, but that was a so many thing. numbers, so many forms. <laughs> um, Riley, how many forms do you have to deal with as an assistant editor? At Honestly, IBW? like when it comes to money and stuff, that's not something that I have handled a lot as an assistant editor or an editorial assistant. Um, that's usually something that like the, the book, the, the people I'm assisting will um, help out with. It's something I'm getting more into now. Um, <laughs> just because things are changing like internally and I am, you know, looking at P&Ls more, but it's definitely not something that I am having to really calculate myself. Mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with that process. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. This is exactly why I was like, okay, cool. We're going to see a lot of different perspectives. So let's actually dive a little bit deeper into your role at IDW, especially working on licensed stuff, which is very different from mm -hmm. originals. Um, you know, if you could talk, kind of like Kiara did, of just like top line information of how your role exists within IEW's ecosystem. If you started out as an editorial assistant, did you come on as an assistant editor and kind of what your track looks like from here? Yeah, I got it. Uh, I was hired last November as an editorial assistant. Um, and I think I became an, an assistant editor in May-ish, uh, sometime this summer, kind of. Um, and yeah, if I continue on, you know, like, forever at IDW. It's like associate editor, editor, and then group editor or special projects editor, things like that. Um, but my roles haven't changed a whole lot uh, going from editorial assistant to assistant editor. Um, I'm still on the same books that I was um, helping out um, the two editors that I help out the most, um, whether that's, you know, doing balloon guides, submitting things to licensors, um, you know, answering emails for them while they're out and stuff. Um, I'm lucky in that both of my editors wanted my creative input on both things. So I wasn't, I was doing admin work, but I was also able to kind of like put my own creative stamp on these comics, um, which I really appreciated. Um, I have been able to take on one comic, um, it's actually a creator-owned comic comic book history of animation um, on my own. So I've been editing that one on my own um, as, a, as an assistant editor. Um, so that's changed a little bit. And I think I'll start getting like my own comics more and more. But um, yeah, going from, through that promotion didn't really change a whole lot. Um, another round of a follow-up question, because I'm sure that some viewers will be like, oh, what did Riley mean by balloon guides yeah i think you're like asking about this one time because you were so interested which i, think I was it's because like from the get-go they're like yes this is an assistant editor's job um to do this so basically when we get the inks uh we used to print them out in sharpie like where the balloons would go so that the production artists would know which characters which because especially with like books like transformers where if you're not familiar with them they all kind of look the same mm -hmm. um and i'm still like googling like who is megatron so i can figure it out i know who that one is but um other ones and so that so they're going to the right place and we can say like hey we want the it to flow like this or we can leave notes like hey like this needs to be a different color or something like that mm -hmm. um and, and we do that digitally now but yeah we have to do that for all of our all of our inks um, and turn them into production so they kind of know where to put all the balloons and stuff. Mm -hmm. I was asking Riley about this probably. This was actually one of our first interactions because as soon as I see like a hook, I'm like, okay, I'm going to get into this person's DMs. We're going to talk about some comics. Um, but, you know, as a freelance editor and even when I was an assistant editor, like lettering remains one of my favorite parts of the process. And it was very few and far between instances of doing the lettering placements ourselves um you know i was the assistant editor during power rangers shattered grid which saw like five different red rangers interacting at one time that was when we did do like right. our own placements to be like it's this red ranger it's right. this <laughs> one not the other one um but overall we would leave it up to the letter to like do their first pass i mean bring layouts mm -hmm. balloons like 
for me just to make sure that it uh, fit in the art. But Andrea and Kara, do you do lettering placements at all at any stage for your letterer? Um, yeah. Andrea can go first. I do, I do not. I, that is no. It's like Michael knows his answer. Michael and me are friends. Yeah, We've had a conversation. You. Look who you're asking. <laughs> no, we don't. We don't do placement. It's completely not part of our um, <laughs> artists. Uh, always, it's almost we almost like require not almost require. We basically require that artists place their own balloons within the art because we think that art will form better. Um, if they pre-draw the balloons and leave that space and have everything roughly. Sometimes some of our books have letters that we hire and a lot of times creators do their own lettering, which is why that's not part of our process. But I think it's fascinating. That that's mm -hmm. I'm so jealous. It's there. so time consuming. <laughs> I know, that's crazy to me. But it takes crazy, forever, honestly. especially on a computer. Hmm. Mm -hmm. It's awful. <laughs> no, thank you. Well, thank there are you. lots yeah. of other things that Riley you have to deal with especially as someone who's working on single issue comics that have sometimes very wild strategies in the direct market with lots of covers mm -hmm. have you ever worked on a, a series that had like you know four or five covers any given issue or just like a mind-boggling amount yeah usually we don't have more than four covers so we'll have like an a cover b cover ri 10 which is retailer incentive for people who don't know and then uh, 25 as well. So, but then we also have, um, retailer exclusive covers, which means like, you know, a, a comic book store could say, Hey, we want to cover just for our store. Um, and so like number ones, like I think Transformer Terminator had a bunch of them. I can't remember exactly how many, um, but it had like a ton. And I, am working on a book that's not released yet. And I don't know if I can talk about it yet, but it, I think I had like at least 50 retailer exclusive covers on it because people are so excited about it. And it's mm -hmm. it's so many covers to keep track of. Um, so yeah, that's definitely something when people are so excited about, because it's like a license. They're like, people are going to love this. You know, like my uh, customers are going to love this. It's definitely interesting to see like, you, you know, like they want spe special covers for that because they know it's going to sell well. Can you confirm though that it was 50? Because that's wild. That's yes, wild. I have, I have a spreadsheet with it. I promise that's it's 50. Too, it's 50. That's no, too many that. and you are a champ for going through <laughs> all of that. And we have to get all the artists approved by like the licensor as well. So it was like 50 emails to the licensor as well. And I said, sorry, mm -hmm. and all of them. I was like, oh. I know you hate me. <laughs> oh, and you work with some pretty um you know intense licensors you know you mentioned marvel um mm -hmm. you know you mentioned transformers those are both storied companies with very rigorous brand approvals so and these are all things that i don't believe that like andrew or kiara really have to deal with in mm -hmm. here no, yeah. no i mean for luckily the the hardest thing we've done is done like exclusives for like bnn for Taz because Taz mm -hmm. and investigators too like books like that that blow up yeah. BNN usually wants, or like, I can't remember the other company, usually like big retailers like BNN want special editions, but we don't change the cover. We just like add a poster or trade right. cards inside. <laughs> That's it. You worked on Taz. Uh, I am roughly on the outside perimeter of working on Taz. <laughs> Luckily, Ali Wilgis, one of our amazing freelancers, handles 98% of that. I would die if I worked <laughs> on that book. So it's, it's a very rigorous book and schedule. Yeah. <laughs> For any viewers, Taz is the Adventure Zone Adventure series Zone, of graphic sorry, novels yeah. from First Second, which is really interesting because it was originally a podcast, mm -hmm. um, but they have, you know, a lot of... Um, internet fans they have a lot of fans um which segues perfectly into andrea because um iron circus which primarily runs through you know kickstarter um you know it's distributed in the book market but really it's not beholden to the market like the other publishers are or at least that's what it seems like from the outside um Yes. Well, we're incredibly lucky because Spike was able to take advantage of Kickstarter coming onto the market. And we basically just propped like a cinder block on the back door of publishing open and just snuck as many people through Kickstarter as we could. Um, and God bless them. They haven't kicked us out yet. So um, 
Yeah, it's it's bananas to me to listen to the stuff that you guys have to go through because literally a lot of times I'll just get an email that says, here's a book that I signed, edit it now, please. All right, see you in a couple of years. Oh my goodness. So it's, it's much more of a, and I don't want to begrudge Spike because she's incredibly busy, which is why I'm able to um, work with Iron Circus and help her out. Um, and there's definitely stuff that I bring to her, but like, I, I don't necessarily feel comfortable calling myself an editor because I have absolutely no experience and I have failed English several times, which it is not unimpossible because I have done it. But Andrea, uh, editing is so much more than just the quote unquote English component. There's project management, there's interpersonal relations with the creators. Like there's so much more to it than just that. Um, and because you don't really, at least from what you said, you don't tackle things like, you know, P and L's or, you know, a million different covers, licensors. Like, can you walk us through kind of what the process is when Spike gives you like a, oh my God, I just signed this please edit this book, like what does that actually entail? A lot of times it'll be um, either she'll find someone that she's interested in or I'll go to her with a project and we'll discuss it. Um, for me, a lot of times it's more how much help will this person need working on their book? Because with a company like Iron Circus, it's literally like five of us part-time. Um, and we, we literally don't have the person power to help someone work on their first graphic novel or, you know, to really like get into the nitty gritty of handholding day by day. Um, so that takes into account uh, the age rating, of course, because with Iron Circus, we go all the way from middle grade all the way up to 18 plus erotica. Um, so we get a really wide range of submissions and projects um, where it fits in the, in the, um, what type of book it is, you know, um, genres where it like a lot of times I'll use the phrase, would it look good on our bookshelf with our other titles? Mm -hmm. So you have to make sure that, you know, Iron Circus's brand is strange and amazing. Well, that doesn't really mean anything. So what is, what are you going to, what are you, what do you think is strange and amazing? How do you keep the brand strong? And then it's really just figure out the timetable of production, hope that everything goes well please don't let anything be wrong with the print files <laughs> because I have had, uh, my husband works, uh, his day job is uh, as a, he's a Mac operator in a printing company. And so he'll tell me like, oh, the CMYK on that one is off. Like, I don't, I don't know what that means. I don't have, I, I don't have that training. Like, oh, those like, we published a book where the original first lettering draft, the eyes uh, didn't have crossbars or they did have crossbars, which apparently I had forgotten is not really acceptable in, in I'm comic. Yeah. yeah. And it, it didn't even occur to me because it's a web comic, you know, the, the guy's just doing it the best he can. And I'm working on, you know, 15 other books at the time. It wasn't until we got back like the first round of proofs for the arc, which by the way, do you guys say arc or ARC? Cause I say arc. arc. Okay. You don't have arc. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's another we, thing. We call yeah. them arcs or galleys. Really. Yeah, galleys. And correct me if I'm wrong, but for Andrea and Kiara uh, and Riley, this is going to blow your mind because it blew my mind when I first learned this too. Sometimes you have to have the book done for the arc and not the actual time to print the actual book. So you lose like no, months. Not, not for us. Not no. for we second pass usually. It's Classic. Sometimes they have to have the. Full <laughs> uh, sometimes like, first Oh my pass. god! R.I.P. to the artist. I mean, we put not final in really big <laughs> yeah, letters. I yeah. think you should get that it is not the final book. We're not <laughs> able to give you the final book for these galleys or arcs. <laughs> we've done we've done arcs that aren't fully colored. Like we had one come out where it was like a good sample of the pages are full color, and then the dude just couldn't get them finished in time, and we, we had to go out that. because of marketing. We used like, to do the first signature. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's crazy, like working when, before I worked for Iron Circus, I only knew about the direct market side and it's like two months of solicitations and then you gotta have a comic on the table. And then now it's like, this doesn't come out until January and I already have it finished and sitting on my shelf. Like I've been sitting on that book for eight months. It's done, it's ready to go. 
yeah, I think like sometimes like a book coming out in January might be just getting started now, like in comics, because like you could do it in five weeks. Insane. How not. do you guys I hope stay that insane? I hope that it started like the middle of November. Yeah, it um, should have started five weeks, but it can be if if you need to. We so literally have like a bit comics. Of, it's like three years for us. Uh, like three two years two years and a half three years usually sometimes more I have <laughs> but we need to have things in a warehouse years. months 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 ahead like right. a lot of people don't understand like for like traditional publishing we we finish the book and it's still a year until it pubs because we need to do like the warehouse we have to fill it in the warehouse we have to make sure it's marketed right we have to make sure it's like with all the clients and distributors it is insane how much time is taken up post it being ready to go it sucks too because everybody's like oh i turned in my pages and you, it doesn't look like you guys are doing anything like there's so much going on mm -hmm. there's so much work that gets done mm -hmm. yeah and it i would be surprised too if um so riley you work with a whole fleet of artists on any given title you work with a uh, writer. You work with sometimes a penciler and an inker, sometimes just a line artist, sometimes a colorist. For Andrea and Kara, your primary experience is working with creators who do everything, right? Mm -hmm. Or close to it. Yeah. Or only the art. I do work with some writer, writer, artists, writer, yeah. artist teams often too. Yeah. So Riley, what is it like working with five people on any given title? It's interesting because like you said, the like, editors are kind of like project managers. So in that sense, we are because we're coordinating everything and it, it's so many different moving parts, especially with licensed comics, because you have to get the pitch from the writer. The pitch goes to the licensor, then it comes back and you go back to the writer and then they write the script and then that goes to the licensor. And then when you get that back, you know, maybe back and forth and then same thing with all the art and everything. And Sometimes the writers, it depends on like what my, what my like head editor prefers, but sometimes the writers work directly with the artist to say like, hey, like I love that layout. I love the way that ink looks like, hey, you need to flip the character something like that. So sometimes they're talking to each other, but like that was something that blew my mind is sometimes the artist and the writer don't even talk to each other at all. Um, and it may not be, you know, until we're saying like, hey, proof this PDF that the art, the writer even sees the art. And like, you know, everybody prefers differently. Um, but it is crazy. It's so many different moving parts. And, you know, yeah, like it, it's, it's weird. <laughs> well, that's actually a perfect segue into my next question, which is, before you had jumped into, um, you know, assistant editorial, is there a part of the process that you found surprising once you became a part of that ecosystem? You're like, oh, I didn't realize that it worked like that. Uh, I was surprised kind of how fast everything moved because like I said, I went to like a traditional publishing, uh, like institute uh, thing, class thing. Um, and they were talking about like what you guys said, like it takes like years for, uh, books to come out. And then I got to, um, IDW and we do like different printers. So like sometimes depending on where the book's going to print, it's going to take like eight weeks or it could take like three weeks. So we could have a book ready three weeks before it comes out, which is crazy. Like that's insane. Um, so I think that was one of the biggest surprises for me. For me, it was, I mean, it, adding to like how long something takes is how many passes, like how many times a human looks at it and still there's typos at the end because we're humans. <laughs> but I, I'm in the least, the least amount of book, and we're talking about least because I've had books that like you triple this by three and that's how many passes we had. You at least have three to four passes before you send it to your compiler slash printer for proofs. Then you have two passes of proofs which is already you're at six, then you have blues and you, and then you have folding gathers, which at that point you really shouldn't be making any changes. <laughs> um, but that's a total of eight times a group of people. Cause it's not only a lot of people don't understand the editors. I'm an editor slash acquiring editor, sometimes in different companies, those are two different things, but I do both things. Um, but there's copy editors and there's freelance copy editors, like production editors. There's people that this is why I don't need to know how to spell because I don't um, because it's not part of my job. It's a copy editor's job to know how to spell. Um, and so many people, so like a group of, let's say, and the author and the artist, if they're two different people. So let's say five people 
these eight passes need to go through those five people eight times um usually uh and it's just insane how many times you see the same book over and over again and I still it means a lot that I still love the book by the end of it because like I could sometimes dream about this book and know exactly what's happening on a page but yeah I uh I woke up out of a dead sleep last night because I remembered uh that we had extra pages in the back of a book to fill a signature and I couldn't remember when it went to print in a, cold, in a cold sweat I was like there's five pages left in that signature <laughs> Oh, no. So for our and viewers, for, a signature yes. is every 16 right. pages of a book. Um, it has to be 16, no more, no less in increments of. Um, so sometimes you can have a little bit of fun trying to figure out how am I going to get to the next increment of 16? Or in the worst of cases, what can I cut to get to the one? In, yeah. You know, less. It's, it's my favorite when I uh, when I became an editor. As a, as a kid and as a reader, I always loved when books came with back matter. Like I grew up reading Lord of the Rings. I love appendixes. And so a lot of times you'll see in um, graphic novels, because if they're collected from single issues, they don't fit signatures a lot of times. So you'll get like the covers or like extra character designs, that sort of thing. And occasionally you'll, you'll find them in a graphic novel. So I can guarantee you if there's extra pages at the end of an Iron Circus book that I edited, I worked really hard to fill those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we often we don't really like make our creators we just let our creators do their thing so like at the end of the day it almost never fits a signature or the worst case scenario they planned it and then it fits the signature perfectly but they forgot we have front matter to put I in which happen. means like cover page mm -hmm. and like have like have, I mean, title page have title mm -hmm. copyright page um so it's always a game of like what can we fit in here it's a lot of author notes and like i love putting in like cover design character design like all the work in progress stuff i just think it's very fun mm -hmm. So it's interesting that you mentioned that, Kiara, because I know when I transitioned to the book market, one of the things that I was surprised at was um, creators having to account for those kinds of things in their scripts, at least at um, Boom. And even when we were collecting, um, you know, single issues to trade, it was more like we, the editor will do the pagination of the book and then we'll tell the creators, here's how many story pages you have to work with. Um, we would be the ones to worry about, like, you gotta have, we, we have to have a title page, a credit page, a copyright page. Um, but Riley, as someone who works in single issues that I imagine you have to do the collection work too, and do you have to paginate those and kind of build out what those trades will look like? Actually, we don't. Uh, we have a books department that collects everything for us. Uh, and so we do get to look at it when it's, <laughs> we do get to look at it when it's, we get to go like over one pass of it. But once we're done with the comics, it's off to the books department. Wow. That is truly a wondrous <laughs> life to live. While right. I was an assistant editor, that was all my responsibility. Oh, no. um, Pageing and figuring out, okay, we have five 22-page single issues. How are we going to fit this into a trade? It would usually be, I think, oh, my God, I don't even remember how long our trades were. I've kind of blocked that out of my memory. <laughs> it's fascinating that no one else has to deal with that unless Andrew, do you have to paginate? Do you paginate? No, uh, we have uh, a print tech who I love very, very much, uh, who I send her all of the finished art and all of the back matter. And then she sends me back a very beautiful PDF that's all laid out and paginated with a complete table of contents and indicia. I love print. You all print, are so... Print tech make the world go round. So we call, Spoiled. We call, book, we call them book maps um, on our, my end. And... It's funny because like it's not like we tell again we just get the pages and then figure it out from then so like depending on how many art pages are given in we figure out how we can get to the 16 but i have to do a lot of pagination sometimes i've had to like um do a book map and add in chapter breaks because mm -hmm. and because mm -hmm. so a lot of people some people don't know comics comics should start on the left i'm mean, not left right <laughs> just like on the right and with chapter pages if you if an author doesn't plan them and adds them into the last and sometimes this happens mm -hmm. adds them into the last second they don't understand i have to put in blanks mm -hmm. so that the chapter page always lands on the right hand um so that would require i've done some crazy i've done some really simple book maps where like the artist knows like done, has done this before just knows and like just hands in like 
a really well done like end to start to end gives it in and sometimes i have to go in and add in blanks and chapter breaks for a check please that was a I say fun, but it was also like kind of awful because we're taking a, a web comic that was um, landscaped and add and make mm-hmm. and because if you have read check, please, it's one panel per page of when she was originally publishing it. I did so much of the building of that book, just like designing it, like figuring out how can we make this attractive to a new audience. And we were putting two of those pages in one page of a printed book. So I had to figure out, and when it ended early, so when a chapter ended with one well, panel, I had to figure out spot art to put there. So mm-hmm. that it looks nice. And I had to think about the back. We did a tweet. Don't do that. Don't do tweets, guys. No, don't do tweets. It was so hard. Emoticons do not print. So like, you have to go in and like make sure that it's like the written book. So like we did a tweet thing at the back. It was super fun. Like I love those books to death. It was so much work though. Um, And it was the most interesting like book Mac pagination thing I had to do. So speaking of fun things, what's your favorite part of the editorial process? I, I can go. I did want to mention, um, I mean, there's a reason that there's a, a best book design category at the Eisner's like it really, really makes a difference. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. It's my favorite thing about Iron Circus because all of our um, the stretch goals for our covers, like for Crossroads at midnight, we did a uh, die cut where it's like a monster reaching through the hole, and it was just me like dumb ideas on the couch at 2 a.m. going, "Hey, you remember those VC Andrews books? Wouldn't that be cool for a horror comic?" And Spike just goes, "Yeah, all right. If we make this much." <laughs> <laughs> if every book all i want is every graphic novel to have french flaps i don't understand why that is we, such a unrealistic happy. ask i was There's like we've been things. doing that forever for a second has <laughs> been doing that since like the start of time like my, our boss no flaps. mark siegel is french the person who started <laughs> for a second is french so we've been having french laps forever <laughs> you guys are design goals i love all of your cover designs and layouts Thank you. Our, I really, our, I love our design team. We have a small, and they work only with us. It's very interesting because uh, First Second is within McMillan's Children's Group, even though we also do adult, people forget. Um, yeah. But we, we, we're within the kids group, but the kids group, all the other imprints share their design team, but we have a very specific, like, graphic novel, three-person design team that and we are actually really collaborative like a lot of times like with check please I worked I was sitting right next to designer Molly Johansson and they I was like oh let's do this let's do these colors let's flip the colors for the second book and they listened to me and it was amazing it's like really collaborative in our office (laughs) anyway that's my favorite part of comics is (laughs) It is though like it's my favorite part is the the email that you send telling them telling the creator the cartoonist that you want to publish their book because you feel like santa claus Mm -hmm. and then it's being like watching the book come together like frankenstein on the slab you're just like making sure your baby looks as pretty as all the Mm -hmm. other babies Mm. what about you kiara for me it's getting the book like it sucks because covid and i can't receive like getting that final like what for us would be an advance because we get a few printed beforehand before they're ready to like ship out but um i've had some really funny photos and like specifically with laura dean because i love that book so much but also like it took 600 passes to get it clean it was it was a lot of work um and i was the millennial pink expert on that book there's so much pink in that book but um <laughs> i have so some epic it thank you i have some epic photos of when i got it because i was just it was like oh um, i was almost crying because it takes so long and so much work and it's years and then you finally have the book and it, it you say santa claus but it feels like christmas every single time that is my favorite moment getting a book you worked so hard on in your hands every I'll book talk that gets sent have you ever press. found your book in a show in a shop sorry mike i didn't mean to interrupt I don't know. uh the first time i ever found my, a book that i worked on in a shop and my name was in print mm-hmm yeah, I would. <laughs> I finally came back to my local, uh, like where I grew up, a, the comic sh- shop there, and found one. I was like, oh. <laughs> Every book that gets sent to press is a little miracle and deserves celebration, which is why it's like 
do monthly comics sometimes really grind people's souls down? Absolutely. But you have the monthly validation of something <laughs> coming on your desk every single month. Right. <laughs> what about you, Riley? Um, my favorite part is definitely finding new artists and writers. Uh, I, I love like getting to dig through Twitter and like finding just like the most amazing things or I, I DM my head editor all the time. I'm like, Hey, like, should this person work on star Wars? Um, and it's so fun, especially because with something like star Wars, if you email somebody and like, Hey, you want to work on star Wars? They're like, of course I want to work on star Wars. Um, mm. So that's definitely my favorite part and like getting to bring new art styles and writing styles and just all kinds of like diverse voices to these books, I think is really, really exciting to me. I hope that every creator that is watching this immediately looks at their social profiles and answers <laughs> the question, is my contact readily available yes, on my please. profile or yes. on my portfolio? If the answer is no, please change that immediately because I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> positive that every single person on this panel will attest that we like to comb through every single social media. It is so exciting. And then when we find someone, we're like, oh my God, yes. I want to work with this person. And then we cannot find an email, especially mm -hmm. if we cannot do some good Google sleuthing. If we still cannot find an email, it is heartbreaking. And all we wanted to do was offer <laughs> you money to do cool things. Yeah. But I, was, I keep saying Twitter is the Twitter. Twitter is a Rolodex. Like I, I, I basically follow, not always, but I follow people I maybe in the future want to work with. And yeah. also like we have so little time as editors. So like, if you make our lives hard, <laughs> we're trying to contact you. I will just stop. Like right. I, I get easily distracted with all the 500 other things I need to be mm -hmm. doing. <laughs> I was going to say, I give people three clicks. It's basically like, all right, you're on your Twitter. You, I don't see any contact information. All right there's no sequential art. Okay. And I'm out. Like, yeah. Yeah. I every as single as creator, like their website. Yeah. 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 Also any creator who is watching this, if you would like to work in comics, panelists, please confirm. It makes it much easier to make a case to hire you. If there are sequential art samples on your portfolio, illustration yep. is amazing. It's a very different skill set. Very yeah, I don't thing. hire people for covers. I hire people for interiors. If you yeah, can do that's... a cover, that's great, but I can hire somebody else to do that. Yeah, we can hire but... like cover artists, which is great. But yeah, it's great to know if you want to like do the cover for your story you're illustrating is really great. You have to do the cover for the story you're illustrating on our end. So <laughs> right. um, we very much... <laughs> Uh, I need to see sequentials and um, if you have an agent obviously you have to contact your agent so that has to be readily available um, but yeah I think that's big I people don't understand or some people even some illustrators don't understand that sequentials are a skill set they're completely different than illustrating um, and I've gotten some here and there some submissions from people that I can tell immediately when I open up that they are an illustrator and not a comics artist yet that mm -hmm. you need like years some good time maybe you should could cut it down and we do it every day but you need to be practicing doing those panels working on that flow etc mm -hmm. well thank you all for spending uh your evening with us for this panel can we close out with just some words of encouragement for folks looking to break into um editorial positions as they probably hope to aspire to one day be an assistant editor themselves? Um, I can go first. Uh, it takes a lot of tries. Uh, it's very hard, but you there's so many adjacent jobs you can do to just get your toe in, not even foot, get your toe in the door. Um, agencies, working for um, things like School Library Journal, uh, review, like review sites and review uh, magazines even library, stuff like that, um, and keep applying. You can apply for different positions and eventually make it editorial. There's a lot of shuffling and musical chairs that goes on, especially in like the big five. So just try anything. Yeah, kind of similarly, I'd say like, just get your foot in anywhere you can. Uh, networking of course is important, but I hate when people say that. Um, but Building community. Right, That's build your community. Um, and just like do anything you can, like whether you're gonna like edit your friend's comic or like 
you know, offer like the local college, be like, Hey, if any of the art students there have any comics, they're looking to edit, like just, just start editing. If you can find a way to do it and do it. And, you know, maybe that'll catch the attention of someone. I, um, I feel like it's important to, it's tough for me because when I was first starting out in comics, I was, um, undiagnosed with ADHD. And I think that that really um, impacted me a lot, but being able to kind of try out a couple of different venues and as long as you're in the industry, it doesn't really matter what you're doing because the comics community is small enough that the people that I worked with at my retail store are the same people that I see that I sell Iron Circus books to. And the, you know, uh, the people that I work with on Iron Circus books are people that I met while, you know, working in distribution. I mean, as long as you are professional, not a jerk, and know how to work well with others, there's really nothing you can't do. And like, maybe your friend is struggling with their website ask and see if you can build one for them squarespace is pretty easy to use i can use it um you know i got my start helping out uh creators scheduling patron posts uh setting up twitch streams there's a lot of creators that just don't have the time that can't can't be bothered to to learn a new technology to figure out how to connect to their audience if you're able to help them with that that's really valuable and if you're good at that, then other creators will recommend you, you know, companies will take notice. You have to, it's, it sucks, but yeah, just put in the work and try to make as many friends as you can. Cause people want to see other people succeed if they're, if they're good, if they're good at their job, if they're good at making the industry better, mm -hmm. we know. I know I want to see all of you succeed. I want to see all of you as full-blown editors. I have been beating this job for terrible last week. I just want the world for you. <laughs> I want the world for all of you, and I want to see all the amazing things you're going to do. We'll have another panel when we're all editor in chiefs, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, write a letter to yourself in the future. Give me five years. <laughs> In five years, I don't know. <laughs> Riley, you, I was, I was batting an eye. I'm like, you became an editor, editorial assistant, so assistant editor in what, six, eight months? I'm like, it took me two years because that's how traditional publishing is. It's about two years for each position or more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <it's> the same. <laughs> well, I'm going to jump in and just say thank you all so much for being a part of this panel. And this was, fantastic even though i was a fly on the wall here i was just like floored hearing you all so this has been a treat and for everybody who is uh, watching this if you liked this panel and want to check out more of our upcoming sessions please hit the subscribe button if you want more content from creator resource you can visit our website creatorresource.com or follow us on facebook twitter or instagram at creator resource additionally and maybe most importantly we need your support to keep the lights on with this project. Uh, Creator Resource is a passion project done on the spare time and in the energy of our contributors. Uh, so to support our site and our expanding efforts, please visit our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash creator resource. We'll be working on some new tiers and some new content for that, including some bonus stuff from these videos, which isn't here yet, so don't go looking for that, but we are on it. Uh, and Bobby has also been hidden here, but thank you so much to our video producer, Bobby, and again, to all of our panelists. And Michael, thank you for moderating. Mm -hmm.